Welcome, everybody. Um, we are going to hear to Max Depkev. He will talk about um, Go, if we need to go and switch to this language from Python. We'll have a few questions at the end. Um, so welcome to Max Depkev. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me well? OK, thanks. So uh, probably wasn't easy to get up for a lot of people, and for me as well, because of the pincho party and other stuff which is going on. So thanks for coming. I really appreciate that. Um, let's find out if you are still on the right talk. I mean, if you are already programming in Golang for like two or three months, then probably you won't find something new in this talk for, your, for yourself. I'm not saying that you should go away or something like that. You can, can stay but just keeping you informed. And the sec second, if you visited the talk about Golang uh, yesterday, you'll probably notice that I will repeat some things because it's hard not to repeat facts. So just, I don't know, you can post something to Facebook while I'm repeating these things or checking your email. Um, but we'll also discuss a lot of things that uh, you didn't hear yesterday. So the goal of the talk is to answer the question, do I need to switch to Golang? Not me, of course, but you, because I already made a decision. Um, and you probably wondering, why am I giving this talk on the Python conference? Well, because it, for some reason it happened so that uh, a lot of people who program in Python are also using Go for some reason. It's really, really easy to use Go if you know Python. We'll try to figure out why during the talk. But first, just a little brief introduction about me and my company. Uh, my name is Max. I live in uh, Moscow, Russia. I'm a Python and Golang developer. I'm the author of several Python libraries, which you can see on this slide. And I'm a EuroPython speaker since uh, 2014 in Berlin. And I also give talks on other conferences from time to time and contribute to other open source libraries. I work for the company called A-Data. Uh, we collect and process online and offline data uh, to get the idea, user data to get the idea of uh, users' interests, intentions, demography, and so on. We process more than one billion unique users per month, and there are more than 2,000 segments in our database, like users who are interested in buying a specific car brand, or users who like to travel to Spain, and so on. We have partners like Google, Oracle, Microsoft, AppNexus, and many more. We have quite a big worldwide user coverage uh, and one of the biggest coverage in Russia and Eastern Europe. For example, for Russia, it's about 80% uh, of all users. And that's it. I promise it will be very brief. So let's get back to the topic. The question was, do I need to switch to Golang? But let's figure out why switch from Python anyway. So the main reason is speed. Python is just not fast enough for a lot of tasks. There are things like... Uh, different ways to make Python faster, like PyPy, Cython, and France, and so on. And just the existence of these tools proves that this is a problem. It exists. Then comes concurrency. Uh, while Python provides us with uh, different ways to solve concurrent tasks, to make concurrent programming, there was no de facto standard until Python 3.4, when AsyncIO was introduced, but in standard library. Um, but still, it, it will take a lot of time for people to, to adapt to it, to get used to it, to know how to do things properly with it, and to switch to Python 3, of course. Gil, it's the most discussed Python problem. While you may use multiprocessing to avoid Gil, still interprocess communication is slow, so this leads us to problem number one. Um, Python doesn't provide a way to, to make true binaries. By, I mean binaries uh, with machine code, then you can just drop into the server and run. There are things like CX freeze and so on, but this is just, just uh, an executable archive with Python stuff. So. And also, you can't write closed source code with Python, so you can't easily distribute your commercial programs because Python code can be easily restored. And while dynamic typing provides us with ease of use, it is also a big source of runtime errors, and the proof of this is the introduction of uh, type hinting in Python 
So it's also like a problem. Okay, so let's briefly formulate uh, language requirements for the language of choice which will solve our problems with Python. It should be modern. By modern I mean that uh, at least it should have proper Unicode support and use all the powers of modern CPUs, right? Like multi-core support and so on. It should be blazingly fast, ideally fast uh, like C, C++, close to its speed. It should be easy to learn and again, ideally, uh, you shouldn't require manual working with memory. It should uh, compile to two binaries with machine code, of course. Um, it should be statically typed and which together with the previous requirement will mean that we'll identify a lot of errors on compilation time and not at runtime. And it should support the main platforms, of course, like Windows, Linux, and Mac. So why go? I mean, there are other languages, right, which can fulfill our requirements. And I believe this slide kind of answer the question because we forgot two more requirements for our language of choice in our previous slide. The community and how widespread the language is. So the first number here is uh, the amount of questions asked in total on Stack Overflow by Tech and the, as of yesterday, I took these numbers yesterday. And the second number is the amount of new questions asked for the last month. So as you can see, Go is clear winner here. Also, I want to show you this Google Trends graph, which shows searching activity for term Golang. We can clearly see here that most, uh, more, more and more searches, uh, search requests are done every year and popularity is constantly increasing. So a little bit of history about Go. Go started as an experiment in uh, Google at 2007 to address some of the problems Google had, like slow builds, working in distributed environments, and so on. There's even a myth that uh, Go was conceived during one of those slow builds while programmers we're waiting for program to compile. Uh, I won't go into details about why Go was designed the way it is now because we would need another 45 minutes or even more for this. Um, if, you can, if you're interested, you can read the link at the end of the slide. I'll just tell you that Go was open sourced in 2009 and it is uh, created by, it was created by a lot of uh, smart people, people who created things like Unix, UTF-8, uh, Java Hotspot Virtual Machine and a lot of other things that we use every day as programmers. Um, Go is already used in a lot of companies throughout the world, for example, Google, Dropbox, uh, and so on. There's a giant list of companies, again, at the link of the end of the slide, so you can visit and have a look if you're interested. Um, now, let's have a look at how a typical Go project look like. Uh, this is called the workspace. A workspace is a directory where all your Go code lives. It is defined by setting a Go path environmental variable. It consists of three directories, pin package, and source. Source is where you put all your source code and your code's dependencies, and bin is for binaries and package for the, uh, the package objects. Um, there is no single repository of packages in Go like uh, there is PyPI in Python. So to install a package, you simply type go get and URL to a package repository. From one side, it's simple and cool. From the other side, there is no way to specify the version of your dependencies. There are no things like requirements.txt and something like that which can freeze your versions of your requirements. So basically, when you do go get package foo, it downloads source files uh, of, of package foo, scans them for input statements to identify dependencies, then downloads files of uh, the current master branch of each dependency, and then compiles all source files all together into binary. This is a big problem because if a backward incompatible change was introduced to master branch of at least one dependency, and you do go get that, you end up with a broken program. Go developers realized that and starting from Go 1.5 enabled a so-called vendor experiment and starting from 1.6, which is the current version of Go, it's not an experiment anymore, but the recommended strategy. It means that you should include a vendor folder uh, in your project and put all your dependencies in there by copying their source code, their source code and, 
and they will be found, found by Go compiler automatically. I know how it probably sounds to a Python programmer, like vendoring, what the, f you know. Uh, but actually, it's okay because uh, a lot of a lot of uh, programs in Python also vendors things. For example, pip, requests, uh, which we all use and like. And I also started to vendor things. You can throw it a matter at me if you want. But actually, vendor isn't that bad because uh, if it's done properly, it can really help your users in the end. You just have to do it right. Uh, there are also two more popular ways to solve a package management problem in Go. Go packaging and go get the bear.io, but I won't talk about them. You can Google if you're interested. And there are also a few other approaches to package management in Go. We won't discuss them, of course, but I like the name of the last one, Johnny Depps. So uh, Go comes with a lot of helpful comments built in. Go format, which formats your code in the only right way. If you don't like how it formats your code, then sorry, you're wrong. It's like PEP8 in Python, but more strict. Um, Go test runs your tests and shows you test coverage. Go fix updates your code to use newer APIs if they're introduced, if some somehow changed in a new version of Go. Go run uh, compiles your code into a binary, then immediately runs it and deletes it in the end. So it's a kind of a scripting language simulation and it works really nice because uh, Go compile time is uh, very small. So uh, this is why a lot of system administrators started to use Go with a scripting language. There is also a race detector and Go vet command which can find errors that the compiler didn't see at compile time and many more. And all, all these things, they are built in right into the language, so you don't need to install any third-party tools and so on. It's uh, really convenient. So let's have a look at the Hello World application. Each file should start with a package definition which will be used for imports by other packages. Um, an executable comment must always use package main. Then we import format package from Go standard library and define a main function which just prints hello world. Uh, to compile this code we run the following comment which produces a binary in our workspace bin directory and then we can just run it like uh, usual binary. So let's do a comparison of Go in Python. What I want, uh, I, I want to show you uh, that some things are different but a lot of things uh, are similar so it's, this is one of the reasons why it's easy for a Python programmer to learn Go. So, first of all, imports. Uh, both languages use imports to import packages. The only difference is that uh, in Go we must surround package name with double quotes. Also, import statement differs a bit if you want to import several packages or to import a package under a different name. Uh, when you import a package, you can use names which define inside inside the package uh, in the same way in both languages. The main difference is that in Go you can only access names which starts with the capital letter. And all other names are considered unexported or private, if you like that term. So they can't be accessed outside the package. Uh, Go has same basic types as Python with a few differences because Go is static type language. So if we have initializers, then we don't need to define types because Go is smart enough to figure out it from them. If we don't have them, then we need to define a type. Um, also Go has signed and unsigned in types which with different bit sizes like int 8, int 60, 16 and so on. And also a dict in Python is called map in Go. And note, note that map uh, defines types of its keys and values. So in this example we have a map which uh, keys and values are assigned integers. And finally a list is called a slice in Go. Variable declarations have more forms uh, in Go than in Python. In Python we just declare variables any way we want with the same syntax. In Go there are two syntaxes full variable declaration with var keyword and uh, short, variable, sh short form of variable declaration which can be used in functions or methods but not at the package level. 
We can also have one line variable declarations in both languages and in Go in both forms, full and short. Both languages have first class functions. It means that the language supports passing functions as arguments uh, to, to other functions, returning them as values from other functions and assigning them to variables. Though, as you can see, the syntax is different. Go is more verbose because of static types and C-like syntax with curly braces. Both languages also support optional positional functional argu arguments. In Python, we call them arcs and use asterisks for them, asterisk for them. And in Go functions that implement them are called variadic functions and use three dot syntax notation for them. And as you can see, we can also pass a slice of numbers in Go and uh, use a backend feature similar to what we have in Python. Unfortunately, Go doesn't have a keyword arguments feature, but you can kind of emulate it with structs. Python doesn't have structs, but basically just a collection of fields. Uh, struct can be initialized only with the needed fields. All fields that are not set during initialization will be set to the zero value. So for example, uh, for string type, it's an empty string. This is probably not very elegant and not the idiomatic way to do things in Go, but it works if you need it. So just showing you that it's possible to emulate quarks in Go. Uh, Python has four in while loops. Go has only four loop, which can take several forms. Uh, here we initialize a list of three integers and then iterate its elements one by one. Notice that the first variable in for loop in Go, with which this is the underscore, and this is an index of the element inside the list. And because we don't need it, we use underscore, and this is the same convention in Python, but in Python, this is just a convention. I mean, you can use any variable name for it and just don't, not, not to use it, but in Go, you have to use an underscore because if you don't use uh, your variable, you, you declare a variable and you don't use it, or you have an import and you don't use it, then the program just won't compile. Go is very, very strict about this, and that leads to a cleaner code in the end. Second form of the for loop can be compared with uh, Python's while loop with a condition. The code is simple, so uh, I won't comment on it. Just know that you can omit init and post statements in for loop. Also, Go has uh, variable plus plus syntax available, which Python doesn't have. And both languages have length function to get the length of the variable. And the third form is the while loop with infinite condition. We all love Python for its list and decomprehensions. I'm sorry, but there are nothing similar in Go. There is, uh, whenever you want to iterate over, over something, you'll just have only one looping construct, the, which is available in Go, a for loop. Some people already asked to it's something similar to Go, but Go developers took the there should be one and only one way of doing things really seriously, maybe too seriously. And it looks like that we won't see any syntactic sugar added to the language in the near time. So for loop is our only friend for ages, probably. Um, you can also notice that common syntax is a little bit different in Go. It's C like. Um, let's talk about conditionals a little bit. Both languages have if statements, which look pretty much the same with one exception. Go allows you to declare variables inside the if, if uh, statement. And these variables are only available during the execution of if statement. I mean, they won't pollute your namespace. This is useless in our current example, but can be very handy in a lot of situations. And really nice feature, I think. Go also has switch statement, which can be compared to Python if elif else chain. Um, notice that switch statement also allows us to declare a variable inside itself, and it also won't be available after switch finishes its execution. You can, of course, write the same if else if else chain in Go, but in most cases, switch statement just looks much, much cleaner and readable. 
Go has the same slicing syntax available as in Python and that is awesome. That's all you need to know about it. Now comes error handling. This is probably one of the most discussed topics about Go. So in Python we use exceptions to handle errors and in Go there are no exceptions. The idiomatic way in Go to check for, for uh, error values is the, uh, I mean, if a function can return, sh should return a variable and an error value. So if this error value is nil, then everything's fine, everything's working fine. If it's not nil, then, then something is wrong and we should act appropriately. So why is this uh, one of the most discussed topics about Go? A lot of people think that a language from the 21st century should have exceptions. And this kind of error handling is like uh, 70th style or something like that. So a lot of people are unhappy about that. And when you start programming in Go, you will notice that uh, a lot of, a, lot, a big part of your code is that these if statements that check for errors. It's very verbose. Anyway, Go developers, they just don't agree with this. They think that it's very cool. It's the proper way of doing things. So we just have to live with that, I think. Um, actually, there are also uh, panic and recover functions, which kind of works like exceptions, but not really in a technical sense. So I won't go into details about them, just know that they are here. So if you are interested, just Google for them. Okay, classes. I have bad news for you, Go doesn't have classes. It has structs and you can attach methods to them. Um, to make a function act as a, a method, you need to define a special receiver argument. This is very similar to Python where a receiver argument is called self. The, the receiver appears in its own argument list between the func keyword and the method name. In this example, p is the receiver argument of type person. Go has a convention uh, that a receiver argument should have uh, a one character name that is the first letter of its type. Also note uh, how we are magically using the string method in Go to change the string representation of a person type. So when you, when you, when you print it, uh, this is kind of uh, similar to Python's uh, Python magic str method, but in Go this is achieved using interfaces, which we won't talk about today because this is a big topic. And actually you can attach uh, methods not to only structs, but to any other types, to integers, to strings, to functions, to whatever. Structs in Go doesn't have constructors, but there is a convention to emulate the constructor by creating a function that does the needed initialization if you need any. Uh, this is our previous uh, person structs initialization rewritten using the constructor function. We can also see a new syntax here. Notice the asterisk near the person type at the function definition. That means that the, the function will return a pointer to a person type. And also notice the ampersand inside function. That is a way to return a pointer to a type. Yes, Go does have pointers, but again, we won't discuss them today. Okay, a few words about inheritance. Go doesn't have one, again. Instead, it has composition or embedding. You can embed parent struct inside a child struct and reuse its, its methods like if they were defined on the child struct. Let's have a look at the example. On the left, we have a classic Python inheritance. And on the right, we have goes embedding doctor type, embeds person type, and gains access to its it method as if it was defined on doctor type. It's kind of inheritance. Okay, let's switch to some cool stuff. Um, we all know that Python has something called context managers. Um, here is a well-known example. We chose the usage of context manager to read a file and automatically close it in the end. Go doesn't have context managers, but does have something similar, which is called a defer. A defer keyword can be used uh, together with any function inside another function and uh, when the function inside which a defer statement is used 
finishes its execution, a defer statement will be called just before exiting the function. It sounds weird, but I hope the example can clarify that a bit. So we are reading a file in that function in Go, and we have a defer f close, and it doesn't matter if any error will happen or something else, the file will be closed anyway. We can also see difference in style here. In Python, we name a function or a method using an underscore between words. And in Go, a convention is to use camel case. Also notice uh, the, uh, how we use a result variable inside a, fu a function definition in Go. Um, this is called the named return value and is treated as a variable defined at the top of the function with a zero value and we already know that a zero value for a string is empty string. Okay, last comparison, concurrent programming. I hope you're able to see the code uh, because I hadn't had to make a font a little bit smaller to fit everything in one slide. So let's start with the amount of code. Usually Python is the winner here, we have to type much, much less code in Python, but this is not the case. Here we have uh, two similar programs which concurrently retrieve the content of two sites. Nothing really to discuss about the Python version. Um, I'm using the async IO together with the AO HTTP package, which should be installed via pip, and async await syntax, which is available starting from Python 3.5. Let's talk about Go version of the code. In Go, uh, concurrent programming is built in right into the language, which is really, really awesome. First, we define a list of URLs to fetch. Then we create a channel for HTTP responses. Channels are used to communicate between different parts of the program. Then for each URL and list, we start a Go routine, which is just a usual function that runs asynchronously and uh, fetches response and sends it into the response channel. To create a Go routine, we just append the Go keyword, and that's it. After that, we start to listen to messages in response channel, and as soon as new message is received, we immediately print it to standard output. Also note, uh, we're using a defer statement here to close response body and we have to cast body to a string because read all returns body as bytes. This is just the details. Um, also, I'm not doing any error handling, uh, handling uh, neither in Python nor in Go, just intentionally here because uh, to, make, to make code shorter and to show you only what's important. So from my point of view, concurrent programming in Go is much cleaner and understandable than in Python, even with async I.O. So there are more, uh, let, let's name uh, some, some Go features that we didn't discuss, but they are here. So making new functions that are used to initialize different types in Go, arrays, which are the basis for slices, pointers that hold the memory address of the variable, Interfaces provide a way to specify uh, a behavior of an object. If something can do this, then it can be used here, kind of a duck typing in Python. Type assertions and type switches, which are used with uh, interfaces to cast them to concrete type. Um, advanced techniques for concurrent programming, like buffer channels and select statements. Unsafe package, which allows us to bypass uh, type safety of Go programs if needed for example, to interact with C or C++. And starting from, uh, from Go 1.5, we can easily cross-compile our programs with, for different platforms just by changing a few environmental variables. Really awesome feature. Um, features that Go lacks list and dig comprehensions. There are no generators in Go, but we can use Go routines and channels to achieve the same behavior. Uh, there are no decorators in Go, but we can easily wrap a function with a function to achieve the same behavior. No exceptions. Um, Go also doesn't have meter classes, descriptors, and magic methods, and probably never will, but who knows. There are also no set and tuples. 
Um, so, conclusion. Both languages have good standard library and uh, a lot of third-party tools for almost everything. That, that's not actually really true because Go doesn't have uh, any good stuff for scientific programming like uh, Pandas, NumPy, and so on. But Go is relatively young, so I think that something, something will be created eventually. Um, due to Python's uh, syntax and syntactic sugar, we can be much, much more productive in Python because we don't need to re-implement things again and again. So for example, if we need to, to get dictionary's keys, we just call keys method. If we want to check if something is contained in a list, we just write if something is in list and so on. But in Go, every time you have to start this for loop to iterate over something and to get what you want. So this is really verbose, but again, this is what we have. Um, on the other hand, Go's concurrency features and its compiled and statically typed nature are worth it, I think so. You can easily develop commercial software with Go and sell the binaries, keeping your source code secure. Um, also, yes, you will spend more time coding in Go, but in the end, I believe that programs which are written in Go are more secure because a lot of uh, errors are found at compile time. And also, if you're developing something that should benefit from concurrent execution, then Go is just a very good choice for these kind of things. And the last point that I would like to address, um, maybe it sounds stupid, but I think that Go doesn't have soul. I mean, I'll try to explain. I mean, uh, when I'm coding, programming something in Python, I feel myself like an artist which creates some masterpiece or something, a hopefully masterpiece. And um, in Go, you just, I don't know, you don't feel any happiness, any satisfaction, you know, during development. You just, I don't know, you just have to try it, maybe just me, but this is what I feel. Um, and let's try to answer our main question, do you need to switch to Go? Of course not, Python is great, and, but do you need to learn Go? Yes, definitely yes, learn Go because this language just won't go away anywhere because uh, it's made by Google. Um, also, the funny thing is that a lot of companies that use Python also use Go or vice versa. So if you are, if you are interested uh, in getting a good job or getting a promotion or something like that, then Go is the, the right language to learn. Um, we don't have time anymore, right? No? Uh, I just uh, want to show a few useful links. Um, so you can make a photo if you want. They will help you in learning Go. And yes, I think that's it. And if you're interested, I am not paid by Google to promote their language. So I've just shared my experience with it and I hope I was able to motivate you somehow to try Go and if at least somebody of you will try go then it was worth it but thanks thank you max so now we have uh, a bit of time for questions wait for the microphone please hi thanks this talk was very useful to me um, I'm a Go newbie, and the most difficult thing I found when maintaining um, an older Go program, meaning like it was a year old, was uh, that the standard library seems to be changing a lot. I was wondering if you had any experience dealing with changes in the standard library and how to fix them or detect them before compiling. Um, I don't know. <laughs> it's a difficult question. I don't have really an answer to that. I don't know. Sorry. Any other question? Yes. 
Hi, yeah. Um, I just wanted to say, um, under what circumstances do you think you might look to migrate from Python to Go? What kind of, is it, for instance, if you were on the Python 2 version and you were looking at implementing some of the concurrency features of Python 3, is it, do you think it's worth looking at Go as an alternative to getting used to the whole concurrency syntax that you've got in Python 3, or do you think that that kind of leap is not really worth doing? Well, if you, I think that if you are happy with your Python code and it works okay, and you don't have any bottlenecks, then of course you don't need Go or anything else. But if you have any problems, then why not to try Go, right? So, from, I mean, you must have, I probably missed the first part of this, I'm sorry, but you, you, how did you get into Go? So what, what drove you to, to move towards Go and obviously kind of get experience? Yeah, we, uh, okay, um, we, we had a, in our company, we had a, a service in Python which uh, wasn't working really good, not because it was written badly or something, just, it just couldn't uh, process, uh, process uh, the data, the amount of data we had. So we decided to try Go, and it, it's working really good right now, and this is, we're, we're real happy with this choice. So we, uh, we, I think that we will, uh, re we will be rewriting our services in Go. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, what is the, uh, what would be an application that you think should not be written in Go that should be written in Python? Like, what would be a, a good example of an app that Python would be better? Mm -hmm. I don't think there is uh, this kind of application that shouldn't be ported to Go. I can't think of a way. Why? Um, you you can. You can port everything in Go. I mean, the point of porting something to Go is only if you need something to make faster, or if you if you really want to benefit from concurrency, because in Python concurrency is hard from my point of view. So that's it. Okay, thank you. We are running out of time, so if you have any more questions, you can uh, meet uh, Max uh, outside or open an open space. Thank you.